talk on Slide Farm. We started yesterday, and um, our guest tonight. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, yes. Before we move into the discussion, I'll just uh, meditate a bit on uh, the topic for today. Um, so, what we've been asked to, to talk about here, it's... Um, um, it's, it, it's a talk titled the artist as creative director, the creative director as artist. And I'll just read out uh, the few sentences that we just the talk. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about what is the role of the artist in contemporary corporate culture in the digital platform economy? What does participating in this world say about one's politics? Many artists keep their position deliberately ambiguous, affirmative and critical at once. We need new tools to understand what is happening, where it might lead, and how it will destroy models of identity and habits of thought that were long taken for granted. Okay, so, yeah, so before we, we uh, dig into these questions, um, what? Before we bring you the answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before you bring me, bring me the answers, and everybody, um, then then I I would like to I would like to try to uh, give a summary of what it says here, which might actually be more of a lengthy uh, um, elaboration. Because first of all, there's the the title, which is kind of tricky. Uh, so the title it addresses uh, the figure of. Uh, uh, the artist and the figure of the creative director. And just to be clear, a creative director is someone who um, sur surveys and controls or directs a creative process. Uh, and it's a term you're using within fashion, within design, within advertising, within marketing, even within the music industry, within the film industry. Um, it has different meaning within these different industries also. For instance, like within fashion, the creative director is the head of the company. Do we agree? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, second, as a consequence of, um, of, uh, of this actually idea, of the creative director, um, no, let me rephrase it. Um, the creative director is characterized by working in fields from an art perspective that is foreign to the art world. Um, and of course, the title implies that now we have to think about the figure of the creative director in the art world. So, as a consequence, what we're dealing with here is basically. Uh, that we have to understand art in an entirely new way. Uh, so the classical way of understanding art, that's the, let's say, the enlightenment idea of the artist um, 
or art or aesthetics as an actor or a sphere apart from the rest of the world, from society. And uh, what happens then in, um, in the 20th century is something else. Suddenly the artist is no longer just an artist, suddenly art is no longer just art, something that happens apart, something that is identical with itself. Suddenly, um, in the 20th century, we start to talk about the artist as something else than an artist. And suddenly in the 20th century, it's raining cats and dogs with all kinds of artist ads. Arts as something else than art, artists. Uh, so first, for instance, in the interwar period, between First and Second World War, we get uh, Bertolt Brecht and Walter Benjamin, who together uh, are reflecting on uh, whether one could conceive of the artist, for instance, as a producer. And I'll take my children now. I, I apologize for that. Um, as a producer. And of course, a producer, it's more like a worker or somebody who is embedded in society. Um, somebody who is not floating above society or uh, working in the margins of society. So we have the idea of the artist as a worker. Then in the 60s we get the idea, for instance, with Joseph, Joseph Beuys of the artist as a shaman. Then uh, in the States we get uh, Andy Warhol expressing the idea that he would like to be a machine. So we get, at least according to Andy Warhol, the idea of the artist as a machine. Um, then we get. Uh, then we get. Um, we have uh, the conceptual artist Joseph Kusut, who was, by the way, very influenced by Warhol, but knew that he had to do something else than pop art to have impact. Who um, who, who writes uh, an important essay about uh, the artist as anthropologist? We have this art historian called Paul Foster, who write, writes about the artist as ethnographer. Then we have uh, the curator Nicolas Boyot uh, in the 90s uh, and in the 90s, who's talking about the artist as DJ, he's talking about the artist as a post producer. Uh, and um, then uh, after we've had all these strange, uh, all, the, all these different kinds of artists as anything but artists, we get maybe an artist to end all artists as. Uh, we get uh, we get Boris Reuss, the German philosopher, who talks about the artist as a consumer, and then he says basically, um, the artist is a consumer. He consumes the roles of other actors beyond the field of art. Um, okay, it's and it's all like nice loop because we started out with the artist as a producer and then the artist as a consumer and um, and then um, yeah and then um, I, I'll just I'll just give you a one quote of Boys Boys what he's literally saying increasingly the artist not only takes over objects in the outside world but also different social roles okay um, so of course, it's not surprising here at Lister that we also have the artist as something else than an artist, the artist as a creative, creative director, for instance. What might be more surprising is that we also, according to the title, have the creative director as artist. And this is just my own idea, but I think that uh, in the 20th century and probably also in the early uh, 21st century, to do something, to, to make art, to be considered an artist, to be considered a real artist, a true artist, an authentic artist, a really good artist, you had to make something new. That was what the avant-garde idea of art was about. Uh, and uh, since everybody within the domain of painting and sculpture had been made, you had to step down from the pedal stand beyond the frame, and, and, and what you ended up doing was going simply, as an artist, going into other domains. But what has not been that easy has been to go from another domain into the art world. So normally we didn't get the shaman as artist, or we didn't get the, the producer as artist, or the consumer as artist. But maybe, but maybe things are changing now. Okay. So 
Ähm, ja. That was pretty much, I think, what I want to say. That said, there is one more thing I have to say. Uh, there is a key key figure in this talk, or he might be a key figure, and that's Andy Warhol. And I guess I don't know if everybody around this table is inspired by Andy Warhol, but it's hard to say that everybody is not indirectly influenced by Andy Warhol. Um, there is um, a, a French art historian called Victor Opal who wrote a very controversial uh, Warhol biography back in the 90s, I think it was, and it was called Andy Warhol, the Passant Grand Artist. Andy Warhol is not a great artist. And uh, his argument was that uh, Andy Warhol was not a great artist simply because what Andy Warhol did was he started out as a commercial artist, as an illustrator, as a, an art director, creative director, um, designer, and then uh, he didn't he didn't stop doing what he was already doing in the 50s, but in the 60s he decided to call what he was already doing art. Um, so there's no transition between the commercial artist and the artist in the world. Uh, it was all like, uh, to begin with it was, I love these shoes, so I paid these shoes for a shoe company, and then later on it was like, I love cables, so I paid cables, and I love dollars, so I, like, so I paid dollars. Okay, um, but Andy Warhol could be, could be seen as this figure who actually was both like, he was both like the, the artist maybe as sort of a creative director and maybe also the creative, or maybe actually the creative director as artist. Okay, so that was a framing. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> I think um, to start with, I would like to say Julian Sigali, you have uh, you have been collaborating with artists on various collections. And uh, Sean Salome, uh, you have been publishing this magazine, The uh, which is at the crossroads of art and fashion. That's one way of describing it. And David Ruddick, you have a, a background in art history, but you, and you started out doing posters and the like for, among others, artists. And uh, at the same time, now you're doing graphic design for other entities, organizations, beyond the art world, of course. So you're all working at the crossroads of art and fashion slash design. Um, and I think it's this zone uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, and um, to begin with, I would like just briefly to hear what you might have what you might have to say about your own role or your own position in your respective field. Like, and by that I don't mean the gray area between art and fashion, but I mean basic difference. Like, Julien, how you see or how you define your own practice in uh, the fashion world. What you do in this, in, yeah. Um, thank you for that introduction, I think. Yeah. I finally understood why I'm up here. It was quite good. <laughs> oh, so cool. Um, I think, there, I mean, ever since I started my brand, I've been working with it, and I uh, came directly from studying, so I never, it's a bit difficult to answer your question where like, my field is, because I never really had the experience to work in a different kind of environment in the industry I'm working with. But, yeah. So, but, yeah, and I, I, I prepared uh, the people up here in the panel uh, before before the talk that I would ask this question and that I would trigger an, an existential crisis, uh, like uh, because normally you prefer that other people define what you're doing. Um, but uh, was was it simply natural for you to uh, when when you started doing for your collections to collaborate with artists? It became natural. It was not at the beginning. It just somehow popped up the idea, like maybe in the third season I was doing the third collection, like through a friend, like I met a friend of a friend and he was a great artist and I really liked his work, I couldn't afford it, so I was like, hey, maybe we should just work together so we can, you know, I can work with you and use your art and your techniques and your aesthetics and combine it with uh, what I do and 
that was really a great experience. Like, it was so easy also, like we understood each other very well, and I think that's how it became really part of my brand, and of my identity of what I, my work. Okay. So that is like a key component of your work, in a way. In a way, yes. In a way. Yeah. And Chan, how, how do you sort of like see your own position in in your field of activity? <laughs> so, thank you for the question. Um, You're welcome. I think <laughs> I really realized that I'm in, in between fields, but maybe it's true, I really joke about it sometimes. Um, I don't feel like fashion was a, something I, I had as a, as a goal in mind. I didn't really realize I would be active in this. Um, I always loved clothes, but I, I still do. I don't, also don't really care about them. But, um, I think it's more uh, how things fell into shape. Um, there is a connecting link, probably through probably the body, the body as a site for art or ideas, let's say, which often and can make fashion interesting or, or the opposite. I hope that fashion can be uh, this site for ideas, um, in and out, outside and inside the body sometimes. And maybe there's a body was a bit absent in the art world in comparison to fashion? Um, not for me, no. but uh, yeah, maybe I miss it when it's not there or I, I look for it a lot. It's possible. <coughs> but trying to answer your question, I think um, the way I define myself uh, originally, I thought I, I, I might be an artist, you know. I, when I was a kid, my parents would be like, of course she's an artist. You know, people say that, you know, you're like, well, what, because I can draw, or like, uh, okay, you know. Does it mean I should be an artist? Or? So it's a funny thought. And I ended up, after some other detours, uh, going to art school. I don't think it was really because I wanted to be an artist, so it became a problem <laughs> in the process of studying, because I was not making art. But um, looking, I was looking for a space, I think, for myself, you know, or a way to look at uh, things in my own way, that's it. So today I don't really create objects, although in fact I do, I forget. But I mean, I, I do with other people, that's it. I don't know if I answered um, your question, but I think that um, I was joking about it earlier. When I'm here, people see my magazine as a fashion magazine. Yeah. Um, when I'm not here, they often see it as a kind of art or artsy, even <laughs> better magazine. Yeah. So I think it, it exists in the world of art, or in the, in the long run, I hope that's a place that it uh, can belong to. Because we try, yeah, we try to imagine possible ways to live, and maybe that's more my definition of art than a definition I might have of fashion. Okay. But I think that it's pretty clear to me. Maybe you are creating that area, or you're working on creating that area between art and fashion. Yeah, maybe. That could be. David? Um, I, I refer to myself as a graphic designer. I'm asked, what do I do? And I call my practice graphic designer. Uh, I do not like graphic design. I'm not a fan of graphic design. I think there is a great deal of skepticism, of cynicism, of uh, concern that I have for what graphic design is as a profession, what its influences on the world, how it's uh, uh, how it's modified as a product, uh, and how it's uh, seen as a kind of uh, a site of production, as a site of exchange, um, but I call myself a graphic designer. Um, this space that you refer to, this liminal zone, and the boundary of art and fashion, the boundary of art and design, I don't think that's a homogenous space. I, I don't see it as a diagram with a grey area between the two. Uh, there are billions of individual vectors of, of art, as it refers to every individual viewer's life, the role it plays in them 
so too for those who see design in their lives. Uh, or um, for a lot of people, these are not conscious spaces. I make a lot of dances, I guess, in, into areas where the product of my work will be seen by two audiences simultaneously. Uh, but it's never concerned me to have to call it art. I actually quite like calling it something I don't like, graphic design, because it always then has to foreground for me some of the concerns that I have about those things. Uh, I have to bring that into the work, and I also simultaneously then get to bring those into traditional art environments as well when I work with artists. Um, there was something you said at the beginning of the talk, which uh, when you were defining creative director and the, the kind of explosion in the prevalence of this term in the last you know, 20 or 30 years, there are other words like as well, art director, which uh, maybe started out in the 60s, 70s, it's a kind of publishing term. Um, that did, I think that there is uh, this, this kind of this multiplication across many, many different strands of culture of the creative director, and it's why maybe <laughs> certain people are. The, Fashion designer who is a creative director, the graphic designer who is a creative director, the magazine publisher who is a creative director seems to have a degree of liberty to work with not just the art world but with other clients now because I think that what that word means is it, it addresses or it speaks to a deficit, a gap that currently exists within modes of production in late capitalism that people are well aware of and are unsure of how to solve and that is to coordinate the affective goal of a material process. And can you uh, be more concrete or give an example of how does it feel? What does it mean? Yeah. These are words that previously were within the territory of artistic production. And like you said, prior to the 20th century, this was also maybe a discrete laboratory for <coughs> structures of meaning, for language of meaning, for, for the shared tools of society discussion. At certain points in the 20th century, certain doors were broken down within this. What has become, I think, clear across the gamut of society, if you want to talk about Warhol, I don't see Warhol as a necessary event and, and you know, influence on my practice, but like you said, we're all post Warhol, in that every viewer is aware that even the most banal process in their life has certain magical affective qualities which, which create for them their worldview, their imagination, their politics, their hopes, their dreams. And no matter how banal the process, increasingly, coordinators of processes are asking somebody, hey, this is going to have a footprint in the popular imagination, this is going to have value as creating other meanings for its audience, maybe we should get someone in who seems to have some kind of experience or comfort or toolkit to coordinate what those things are, because we make shoes, because we make X, Y, Z, and this person yeah. makes meaning, poetry, whatever. And maybe 30, 40 years ago, someone like Warhol would have done an unprecedented collaboration. But now someone picks up the, you know, someone sends a direct message to a creative director. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, this um, uh, inflation in the use of the word creative director has, do you think it has something to do with either that creative processes have become more collective, or uh, could it have something, maybe, could, could it could have something to do maybe with, with, uh, with the fact that we live in a world where mediator, mediators play a bigger role. It's, it's a bit abstract, but you know, like, uh, like we know a creative process today, it's not like, it's not one creator, one product. But there are a lot, a lot of mediators inside that process. Uh, whether it's the people who make the, the, the actual garment somewhere, uh, the big market, or whether it's uh, the, the one who prints out uh, your vinyl or wall. Or, or, uh, I, yeah. I, I don't know, but maybe. maybe I, I have the feeling that art has become more collective, and therefore you need some guidance, you need a creative director. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, maybe I can say something. Um, I often have the feeling that the term creative director comes when we also don't really know what to say or how to call this. It's 
situation, you have a creative person I was also thinking to them who sometimes to call someone an artist in the context of an enterprise or a corporation that is um, creating marketing plans to sell a product. Um, I I was telling you before at some point my partner Florence and I thought, okay, how do we call each other? How do we call ourselves, you know? We're all alone in here, doing everything. So what do people call themselves in a case like ours? Meaning that we, we are that, but also probably at least six layers of other tasks under um, as well. Yeah. And it's funny to call yourself something director when you're, when you're, when you're your own owner and your own <coughs> business. So yeah. we always, I think the, during the first years, we were always laughing about it. You know? But you work with a lot of free things at the magazine, don't you? Yeah, we do. So, so, but the, you, the, so, so it's not that actually there are a lot of people working for the magazine, mm -hmm. but uh, they are foreign mm -hmm. workers. They're not part of the structure. Mm -hmm. uh, they are free agents. Yeah, they are. I hope we also are somehow. But the the the, 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 the term director also is, I guess, sometimes um, a bit aggressive. You know, I think, or I sometimes honestly identify with. It. I'm not directing someone creatively. Yeah. Well, I hope I'm not. Or if I am, it's a, you know maybe it's a printer or uh, someone who's creating a, a sculpture that is like a technical task. Um, I see myself more as a, maybe a pointer, or I like to show things I like to say to the world. Or maybe you were talking about criticism before. You know, yeah. are things critical, or are we looking for? Critical mind. I feel like a lot of times my role towards my clients has to do with that. You know, maybe I have a knowledge of the art that they don't. But mostly, I think even going to art school, the main thing I learned was to be self-critical and to be critical in general and open. I don't know if the school taught me that, but that's what I wanted out of it. I think the school told you that. It's taught you that. Yeah, I think that's what art schools are about. I mean, yeah, maybe they should critical. be about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then you would leave the school after the first day. Yeah. I don't know if the school I went to, uh, I don't know if that was part of the language. But um, yeah, I don't know if I'm a mediator. I think I, I like this idea of more being a critic, maybe. You know, I also consume art, I look at stuff, and um, I, I show it in my own way. You know, I give a feedback, let's say, to the artist that I might work with through collaborating with them. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they learn something out of it. You know, it's like a feedback loop. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, in the same way someone who yeah, writes about art, you know, gives uh, an amount of information in a specific context that they operate in temporarily. And then that also has an influence on the art that is created in the long run, you know. Also because critics give a form of validation, maybe. Mm -hmm. but, um, I think I most of the time identify myself more with that um, uh, than uh, direct. Uh, yeah. you know, I don't, I'm not so interested in directing. And should, yeah. Do you? Uh, because in my papers, you have been described as a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. um, more than that, as Jean Valéry said, I'm also like. How does your structure function? I'm a creative director, but I'm some sort of a director. I'm also a brand owner. I'm also a founder. Yeah. I'm also taking. You have employees? Sorry? You have employees? Not direct employees, more freelance employees, but yeah. like for a few years now, so she just doesn't want to get employed. So <laughs> that's a different story. I have interns, of course, so I'm like directing them, leading them. And I have a shop, so I'm also a shop owner, I'm also a salesperson. Yeah. I do a lot, like loads of various things, and I guess I'm less a critic, I'm more like a gatherer of people, like, especially if I'm doing anything alone. There's too much yeah. work, too much techniques you need to have, too much uh, you need to talk for, you need like models, you need producers, you need sales people, sales people. You need a lot of people to make it work. And it, I think for me, it's more also about like how to gather the people to get the best out of everyone. Yeah. And that's also with the collaborations we do. It's like when we do it, it mostly comes natural and it's always, we only do it if it makes sense and like if it clicks somehow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, 
early on, people, people uh, great artists, they were called masters. And it was sort of like, for many reasons, one reason was that they had, um, what do you call it? Not, you don't call it, you don't, you didn't call it assistants, but you had some sort of like people working for you. But you were also a master because you were the best person doing, doing the job. Uh, and the master is somebody who is like controlling things, who is who's controlling everything. But you should always find people who are better than you. But yeah. you need to control it. So it's not necessarily it has to be the best. But not the best at production. No. But as the best person at it. Yeah. But I think I think we see that Michelangelo, he thought of himself as the best at whatever he did. There is the story about uh, the Sistine Chapel that it was painted in, I don't know, five or six years, and for two years, with three assistants, they painted one third of it, and then he kicked them out because he thought they were lousy, and then the last three years, he finished two, the last two thirds of the Sistine Chapel. And basically, he, what this story tells me is he thinks he's the best at doing everything. <laughs> Maybe he was, yeah. Um, uh, but today, an artist, and I think that's what you're saying. Uh, or a creator thinks of him or herself as no. I I know there are certain things that I'm that I'm not the best at, uh, and I, at least I know that I might get some people to do this job in a better way than I could do. That's basically what you're saying you're doing. Anyway. Okay. And, and and within what domains or what uh, what uh, you do that is it like is it like okay is it like the Somebody who's really good at working texture, or somebody who's better at colors than you, or somebody who is uh, making patterns, and you actually don't make patterns because you just go for the shape. Or... I mean, there's various areas where it's the case, but just speaking of the collaborations, one of the biggest reasons why we do artist collaborations is because we can't handle technique, the techniques they bring to the table. Like, they have like, a completely different technique. There was, like, I work with guys who are really only working with 3D programs. I could never do that, but they brought it to the table, and the, this is like where you can generate something new. And I think also flipping back to the very beginning, where you said like the body in art sometimes is missing. This is what I get back to them. Like that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I started to work with Katarina Rossi, for example. Yeah. Like for her, it was the most uh, interesting part about it is like to really spray on the body, like spray on the body. So. I give something back as well, but you meet somewhere in there. Uh -huh. I'm thinking, so, like, I, well, I, I, I think I see a picture, or maybe it's just an idea I, I have been working on for some time already. <laughs> but but I, what I hear you saying, at least Jan and Julien, that um, that an artist might, or a creator, a creative person might not simply be somebody who, who creates something new, but who is directing a process. And maybe it's part of we're, we're part of this network culture where we're working not like in in cubicles on our own, but we're constantly uh, switching on and off different uh, networks, and, and we're constantly hooked up in different constellations. And therefore, what master is doing is not controlling a process or a creator from each C, but rather trying to get a direction. What do you think about that? That interesting work with her ID maker, what was it? Ideator. Uh, ideator, I think that's another topic yeah. which could be brought to the table. Sh Shannon has yeah. been uh, <laughs> called an ideator. Conceiving of herself as an ideator. Right? Maybe that's the part where we which we create, kind of can create ideas, like, not just direct, but also create ideas. Yeah, but you don't necessarily materialize all of all of them or all of it. But sometimes we're forced to. So. I I do think for me that um, I struggle a little bit with the idea of. Uh, one individual monopolizing the creative labor of um, a multitude in order to manifest their vision. Sorry, very uh, uh, It was beautiful for um, I think that though the network capabilities and tools which are being... Sorry. 
Uh, we're in a technological paradigm where uh, people are being endowed with ex extraordinary network ability. Uh, the regional artist, the regional director, can basically be one step removed in the communication sense from just about every other creative in the world. There are very, very few individuals now who are actually remote in terms of at least being able to make the arts or potentially involved in a project or uh, and so I think a lot of people spend their time you could say it's intelligent, it's it's, uh, it's, it's one way of reading it, but they've assessed these market conditions, they accrue whatever capital is necessary so that when they make the arts they can work with whatever creatives that they want. Um, but uh, I, I do think that if you were to say, okay, that's our reality now, everyone potentially has this possibility, uh, then I think that there, an uncanny value starts to accumulate for the individual that can generate seemingly meaningful statements, meaningful and executed statements in terms of language, visual culture, or you know, of, of meaning, broadcast, from their own practice. And I think that though the trend now is seeing the rise of empowered creatives who have become hyperfunctional network actors, the uncanny value, therefore, as in any market. The, the, unc the uncanny value. The uncanny value for me is a term I would use to describe something which, uh, by its deficit now, is clearly undervalued and therefore culturally dependent and will swing back towards. I can't point in the police day or the fair to the promulgation or the rise of these individual ateliers because they don't exist yet but what I'm seeing is the rise of what will become the demand for these ateliers which is that's clearly what is not being generated from our current market conditions and therefore when people do emerge who have those skill sets or have practices that resemble that they will have they will be seen as suddenly meaningful counter voices, they'll be able to say things that the network actors cannot, they may be able to criticize network action in a way that the network actor can't. We will naturally gravitate towards, I think, a plenitude of voices if it means that we can support arguments that couldn't be made otherwise. And therefore, if those are the creative practices which aren't currently being empowered by this reality, then those who find the means to grow those practices, I think, potentially, have a model, whether or not it finds an audience and whether or not it finds a, a, a means to sustain itself financially, that could be of value in the future. So I do want to stand up at this moment and say that I think that those factors are, I, I, I'm very interested in that as a model of working. Uh, from my studio, from my work, there are definitely ways in which um, I think what Julian describes is, is really, really important, recognizing these skills or, or things that you can bring to the table. And I think uh, part of the way that I, I see the potential role of the studio is to be an environment or a workshop where we can cultivate skills of that nature, which are unusual or different or, or not necessarily suggested by an existing market demand. So, yeah, so you're saying that uh, network creation, uh, it can be empowering, um, but at the same time, network creation can also, I imagine, be disempowering. That you might feel like, oh, I'm just a node in a big network, I'm just a small Spec in the universe, um, uh, and, and, uh, and you, so in working when you work when you have a network practice, you can both feel very small if you focus on yourself, and very big if you focus on the impact you have throughout the network. I mean, I like. Do you know these feelings? I, like to, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to like jump. Is it just me? <laughs> but I like to. That's where I think I find comfort in words that come from. Um, they're normally used to describe very different practices to to uh, or, or very different outputs to creative director and graphic designer. Like I, I think a lot about the idea of the lyric, uh, lyrical work and oral work which is essentially the product of a singular voice. So it's the expression of an individual perspective or point of view. If you operate from a network perspective, you start to think of your work in terms of the market, in terms of the statement or the phrase which the, which the audience is ready to kind of receive and hear and consume. And you end up with products that can be successful, that can reach that. But what cannot really survive a process of six people is the voice, the lyric, the individual exclamation which may be peculiar, which may illuminate uh, you know, a whole 
the spectrum of life or, or you know, the whole world. So, so it's sort of like, like been a, a lot of birds chattering. Is that sort of like the way you use well, that, 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 that that vision of the network? If I talk about lyricality, if I walk into a yeah. meeting with a client, and I talk about lyricality, that is already a difficult phraseology to use. It is it's problematic. Because it's, 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 the client cannot be lyrical, the brand can be lyrical, the individuals around that table, the director must run it by, the marketing director must run it by the head of sales. You know, no one of them has a voice. They have a gestalt kind of network voice. And I think what is lost in the network is the lyrical. It's this sense which we all have, I think, an affinity for. That's why in my practice, like, it's one of the areas I like to work. It means a lot to us. We have been touched by lyrical work. When we talk about art with a capital A, why we're here at the fair, what we're looking for, I think for many of us, we are, we are listening out for that moment. We're struck by birdsong, by this, this call, this thing, which may be alien, which we may not know the answer, it may not necessarily provoke a meaning, or, or, or some kind of, like, Fin like finite uh, kind of unit of value which comes to us, but still that clarion call is what strikes us out of the moment. And I think what's really interesting to me is the, the inability of network processes to manifest output like that, and where it suggests that maybe other processes will be done. Yeah. I'll show them what's no, no, it's, it's okay, it's okay. It's, uh, <clears throat> that's one definition of network. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, there is also this question uh, that is brought up in, um, in the pitch for us here tonight. Uh, it's the question of developing new tools. A new tool that can also be a new concept. Uh, and uh, basically, you are all working with concepts, I presume. Like, for instance, when you decide on what to call a collection or what to call a magazine. Or and I know uh, that you're developing all kinds of concepts of playing around with all kinds of new words that only you use. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> how, how important has phrasing been for you in your practice? How to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, phrasing, yeah, I don't know. You could also say, no, I'm, I, I, I guess I'm a mute just visual creator. And, uh, I guess yeah. being a small brand like what you said, like there's a lot of voices which are heard at the table. There's never really a corporate company who's like destroying the ideas or anything like it. It's really cool. And uh, coming back to your question, well, well, was well, well, my question was not that here, but no, I, no but I, I, I was thinking like, uh, are you trying to? Um, how much do you work with articulating what you're doing in another way uh, in order for people to see what's genuine or new about what you're doing, or genuinely different? The art is, artic is the articulation process important for you? I know, I know it is for you, so, but like, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. It's a big part of yeah. what we do and why you kind of recognize what we do since yeah. almost nine years now. It's like stays with unrecognizable. Is that the right word for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if you apply a new term to something that might look rather similar, then you might catapult that thing into a category of its own. I think we are a category of our own, so... <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, that's what we aim to be, and that's what we work for. Like, it's not highest goal to reach, but I think it's what we try to translate yeah. into like our own language. Yeah. Uh, no, I can just say, look, there is this story about Jasper Johns. Um, uh, I think it's, there is an artist who is visiting Jasper Johns in his studio, and Jasper Johns, the painter, he cannot, nobody is really, no, sorry, it's Robert Rothenberg. Somebody is visiting Robert Rauschenberg, and Robert Rauschenberg he cannot figure out um, what he should call. Uh, no, he cannot. He cannot get people interested in his work. And then this person says, "Well, why don't you give it another name? Why do you keep calling it painting? It doesn't look like painting. So you're a, you're a failure as a painter. Why don't you call it something else?" And then he starts calling it combined paintings. Uh, 
that that is Ramalakta. Yeah. And then and then and then who was the other person? Who, who oh, actually, I think I think the other person was. Sounds like Daddy. No, I, I think I think it was something like uh, who who invented the mobile? It, I think it was Kolda, maybe. Maybe it was Kolda who said, well, to begin with, uh, people weren't interested in my art either, except the Kolda. Uh, and then I, I, I called it uh, mobiles, and then people, they, they, they were really hooked, they could see, oh, this is a mobile, not a sculpture, it's something new. And, and uh, the same uh, work for Ron Brandenburg, he started calling his paintings uh, combines, it worked much better. So, uh, and, and, and the reason why I bring it up here is because, like, we already have the question, should we call yourself an artist or a creator or a creative director or so on? So, I'm simply asking that how reflexive are you about that articulated process where you can touch one category and end up in another category, maybe of your own, uh, uh, where you are beyond compare and therefore the best? <laughs> well, uh, or you could view that, that strategy in a less cynical way, simply as something necessary for people to see here in that. But, yeah. but I think I think that your your example is really great. And, and like you know, Calder and the mobile. Calder didn't stop calling himself an artist because he produced mobiles. No. Calder didn't reject the terminology of artist. That he used this neologies of mobile to describe a sculpture, form of sculpture, which was with emotion, and um, and in doing so created a space for people to. Make Obviously, showed he didn't expand the boundaries of sculpture. He showed an area of sculpture which previously was difficult to explore because we lacked terms for it. Yeah. I think a huge part of my work. I, I have no problem calling myself a graphic I don't care. I, I, like, and also, I like. I'm not hoping to be called an artist if my work creates meaning. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as a suddenly unlocking a high level. It's the work and the tools that are in the work that are of interest to me. And. I think that uh, I think there's phenomenal power in language. I think, thank God, it's one of the few areas of art and culture which remains quasi-mystical, magical, slippery, uncanny, uh, which means it hasn't been quite fully colonized by mechanical process. It can create enormous affect, change, currency, simply by redefining something. But what I'm not interested in doing is redefining myself. For the audience, I'm interested in giving them tools. But for, for it to reflect back to me, then I become just another Lake Afters model of self power, <laughs> where it's like, oh, he invented a new way to brand himself and, and make money at that. It's not so interesting no, no, as a result of gold practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What Cold did with so the mobile is really interesting. Giving the public or the users or consumers or the audience tools to use what you're presenting in the world in, in the appropriate manner. Yeah, and I, I think that's, I'm sorry to, to, to harm, I, I don't want to no, you don't sorry. The dialogue. I enjoy it. But when we, when, when we talk about like, what people are maybe looking for, what they're hoping for, what is the value of a creative director, yeah. it's that whether we like it or not, these processes that we create, the, the, you know, we've, we've run the long train for the late 20th century and we know that this has meaning. And it has meaning that goes all the way to the end of the world. You know, we're now in what is recognized as the Anthropocene. You know, like it's both like a uh, refreshing watery beverage that I need to drink in order to like stay upright tomorrow, and also uh, uh, like a fucking hand grenade, a symbol of the death of our planet. It's all those things and everything in between. We don't need an artist. So, so we don't do Warhol anymore. Like, we are all decoding this stuff. And everyone who is making something is realizing that we are building symbols of meaning building tools for understanding our world. As we build it, we're also kind of building reality. And so this, this idea of a creative director is, I think, simply the conversion into that process of shit. Maybe we should think about how we coordinate that. I mean, some people do it really badly, but horrible in the Paris person. Sell more shit, obviously do it. Other people say this is an opportunity to start a conversation. But these aren't the traditional tools of promoting desire, getting the brand out there, just, just Finishing that. There's this whole other category of the object which we're realizing we all touch. Excellent. And um, this brings me to um, 
a sweater. <laughs> I said I would bring it up. I love the sweater. The sweater. The last sweater. The only sweater, which is called the last sweater. Uh, but yeah, Julien, this year or last year? It was last winter. Last, last year. Last year. Yeah. Beginning of this year. Yeah. You, you, you made a sweater that was a reply to climate change. And I also said I would bring this up. And I have been Googling again. I did it, I've been not but I've been Googling again. And what I found out, and what I already knew, was that yeah, the fashion industry is supposedly guilty of 10% of all greenhouse emissions. Um, and, um, um, but I also know that there are tremendous uh, initiatives in that world to change things. It's very much like the other world, we constantly talk about all the big problems, climate change and so on. And the moment uh, we're invited to talk at uh, some uh, fair in Basel, then uh, we take uh, the plane instead of a train, uh, which is my case. So, um, but you decided to make a response to climate change uh, with a sweater, and it's called the last sweater. And uh, I would say, that, that phrasing, the last sweater, what does it mean? What, the, what did it imply? What was the idea? Uh, I mean, I didn't come up with it all no. by myself. No, no, no. <laughs> You're a great director. I was part of a team, like yeah. the World Wildlife Fund. Yeah. They were actually doing the campaign, and then there was an art director, like an art agent. Like an agent. Like an agent. Yeah. Okay, an agent. Ad agency, like working with them, and they approached me, and then we kind of sat together, and they already did something similar before, but wasn't strong enough, or that was my opinion. <laughs> like the design wasn't strong enough, the naming was okay, and then they came up with this idea of calling it the last sweater, which is very simply put, soon we won't need any warm sweaters anymore because it's going to be hot in And, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're creating like a sweater for. Um, um, yeah, for a bad. basically for a future that will wear, 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 which is so hot that people will no longer wear it. Exactly. It's, that was it's, a bit the idea, but yeah. also it's just a campaign, you know, like it's just a wording for a campaign, but it yeah. makes people understand <clears throat> it really clear, very simple. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, but it, it, it's really strange because you, you sound like by presenting the sweater as the last sweater, you are saying, okay, yes, I participate in emission of greenhouse gases and climate change, um, and if I just do it a bit more, I'll make it even more clear uh, what the problem is. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's, it's very twisted. It's it is it also like calling it the last sweater. Which we, which my own clothing, yeah. like season after season, new lines. So it's a bit ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, since I'm a really tiny, tiny little part of this percentage, you describe it to 10%. Yeah. yeah. Like, I, I don't really belong there. <laughs> no, so. no, 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 no. But I was thinking whether we should just. Okay. We've already been big for an hour. Maybe we should just see the last letter. Should we see the last letter? I would like yes, to see the last letter. Yes. I think it's very beautiful. I like How many last okay. sweaters is there? If we're going One? to the, uh, yeah, oh yeah, that's <laughs> five hundred. Yeah. All sold out. Yeah, we got here. That's the last sweater. But still available on eBay, anyone? Is it on eBay? Yeah, two hundred and forty-five. Two hundred and forty-five. Two hundred and forty-five. Two hundred and forty-five. Thank you for warming. Thank you for warming. Okay. No, but okay. Th this will be the, the the last question. So, uh, and it, it's a difficult question. But it said um, in the pitch for this talk that maybe you are or we are all rather ambiguous these days. That we know that maybe because we're in a network world where everything is tied together, there is no outside step outside and we cannot simply criticize something at a distance as if we're not part of it. We know that we're both uh, a part of uh, the problem and a part of maybe the solution. And therefore, uh, a lot of what 
we do as creatives has that ambiguity to us, or it might have that ambiguity to us. Is it possible to go beyond that ambiguity, or should we do it? Should we try to go beyond that ambiguity? That's all right. For the last last thing I'm wondering about that you also might have maybe a comment on. I think that uh, one of the greatest uh, weapons of art is uh, paradox. Yep. Um, maybe that's why I'm interested in it. It's very rare, I feel, to find these places where it's okay to, yeah, maybe not answer every question. Um, I get really bored when we are too much into ambiguity, though. I mean, that makes me in an ambiguous position, yeah, yeah. in ambiguous positions, yeah. make me uncomfortable. Yeah. Maybe it's my personality. I look for, you know, radical statements. And, as you said, uh, what was the term you used, you know, uh, exclamations or, as opposed to... Um, Political and affirmative. Affirmative, yeah. affirmations, yeah. 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 I know I'm attracted to that. That's why I'm attracted to brands, you know, talk about bottled water. I was born in the 80s, I loved the, you know, I want people to tell me what to do, right? Cool, cool, cool. In a way, right. I, it's effective. Like um, I guess uh, for me, if I think about ambiguity or uh, keeping it, I, I realize that um, the only thing that I think has a lot of value for me now is to create or participate in situations that get me and the others outside of themselves, basically. I feel like that's an important thing. I feel like in, at the end of the day, at the end of the year, you know, when I pay my taxes, I think. I hope it's what I do. That's what I try to... Push people a bit. To, to oh, favor. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to like put yourself at risk all the time, but just think about, you know, put yourself in a situation where you get outside of your... Not necessarily your comfort zone, but you go somewhere, you know, and then you... You have it? Don't you? Mm -hmm. I'm just listening. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> Sorry. I, I said you put, you, you question your habits, your routines, maybe? Yeah, maybe. The way you look at stuff, you know, what you look at, how do you look at it? You know, I feel like in a way that's what I'm, I'm, I try to do with my magazine, you know. Stage things and then stage how do we look at them, how do we take them, how do we consume them, where do we put them? How do we manage them making us uncomfortable or seduced or, you know, what's the emotional life around it? Um, where I want to get to, I guess, is this idea that I think if you get outside of yourself a little bit, yeah, maybe you wear a provocative sweater. I mean, I love the statement, right? <laughs> what's this is okay. Right? Ten years. Ten years. Where were you? It's, a, it's the birthday sweater of a, <laughs> of a few friends and, uh, and I. Um, um, anyway, what I, where I want to get to is that I think it's, it's interesting to put yourself at risk in the sense that we maybe tend to be not humble enough in our lives. I mean, not art artists maybe, but everybody. You know, how can you look for a place when you realize that the world is big? And not that you're small and you're worthless, but like things are relative. And you, that also means you have power to do things and to take actions and make decisions, you know? Do I buy the sweater, do I not buy And that's great if and I don't know if it's also somewhat humble. Because you know that you're not the best at doing everything. No, that's why my magazine has a name and that's not mine, you know? I mean, I'm always very impressed by people who can put their name on something. Yeah. In a way, I envy it, you know? Like, I never even thought of it. Uh, yeah, that's an answer. Cool. Uh, comments? Last comment? Two, two sentences? Two sentences. Two sentences. Like, cut to the bone. Uh, oh gosh, I can't do it. Two? Figuratively speaking, two sentences. I start, I start by responding to your initial comments by saying I don't believe in the finitude of art. I don't believe it's a homogenous space. I don't believe it's got an inside and an outside. Uh, the, these are, and when you talk about networks, and we, we live in a network world, 
I don't believe there is the network, a network. Mm -hmm. There is a right zone which extends into all of us and it's different for every single one of us to have these connections and permeate and what the things are on the um, What I see, I love art, even, you know, like capital A, my background studying art history has been moving me many times throughout my life because I think it's a very sophisticated beautiful system of letting information, feeling, meaning, survive the lifetime of one human being. When I die, this network, this world will die with me. But things I make in my lifetime can continue to have value, but all insist that I may ne never know of and possibly predict existed. Yes, I believe we're living in a time of global catastrophe, and I'll use that word. And many of the systems which, with which I interact with on a daily basis are ruinous, destructive, and, and unpowerful even to myself. The thing that gets me up in the morning and that I feel good about is the idea that if I can find ways to embed in the work that I do or the tools that I make, some of this meaning so that it may survive beyond whatever this moment is, then I feel okay. And that's really the way I'm Cool. Beautiful. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. But then we leave it we leave it at the frame. We leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, yeah, today. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. giving me the possibility to chat with you. Um, uh, and uh, then, uh, then I'd like to hear if there are any questions from the audience. Well, I think we should ask you a question. Oh yeah, please. I have been talking online, it's like, yeah, really? Could I please get more microphones? Yes, please. No. Hello, Hello. Hi. 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 Hi.
he's, he's now just, uh, I mean, the artist has created the director, he's interested in using that term, if he's being referred to as an artist, uh, how are they describing his, you know, as a figure? Sorry, I didn't mean to like. Yeah, so he's no longer, in this context, being referred to as a critic director, uh, artist and designer. Uh -huh. So there's, there's your artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Artist, yeah. Artist, yeah. But, I, but I, think, I think the fields of art and fashion and advertising and activism and philosophy and whatever you have, they have been, they are collapsing. The strange thing is that they have been collapsing for a I don't know, uh, 100, 200 years. So, so and, many. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the walls are still standing. Uh, so, so, yeah. Okay. I guess we uh, call it ready. We stop here, unless there is a last question. No last question, no last question. No, no last question. No last question. Thank you so much for coming. Have an excellent evening here in Boston.